there seems to be a bit of confusion surrounding element queries and container queries. So today I'm going to take you from the ground up so there'd be no more confusion. So here I'm linking in an element query plugin that will interpret and read CSS that isn't valid CSS right now. And that's how we can discuss and talk about these ideas. So first, what is style scoping or what is a scoped style? So the concept of style scoping is the idea that CSS can be scoped to an element. Uh, now Firefox implemented this and other people implemented this as an idea that uh, once you have scoped CSS at an element level, uh, only CSS for that element and its children can be written in that scope. So the idea, the original idea of a scoped style was uh, to limit CSS rules to one element and its children. But that's not quite the same idea that we're dealing with when you deal with element queries. And because of this, that's why scope styles are being dropped. Um, and they're, they're not the right direction or they're not the right solution. So they actually did have some browser support, but they're losing that browser support. So I propose something kind of like this for CSS. So here we have an at rule called at element, and it is asking, hello, Dom, is there an HTML element in the document object model? And if that is true, this statement right here, if there is an HTML element, these brackets wrap a block of CSS styles which will apply to the page. So I can say, if there's an HTML element, make the body green. And what we see over here, because there is an HTML element and there's also a body element, um, because the HTML element is present, the body style applies. So this is a scoped style. This is not really an element query or container query at the moment. This is just the idea that um, if we say, hey, is there an input on the page? Apply this block of styles. There's no input, and so this CSS never makes it to the page. It's just that simple. Now you'll notice that input is a void element. There's no possibility for an input to have children. There are no child elements of an input ever. It is like the last of its line because it can't even contain another element. So there's no possibility that in the old way of thinking about style scoping, you, couldn't, you would never be writing scope styles for children of inputs because that can't exist. So one thing that you notice right away about this form of style scoping is that it is not limited to just that element and its children. Style scoping applies based on certain conditions but the styles that it wraps could be for any element anywhere on the page if it exists. Um, it could even be the HTML element itself. So all I have to do to show that is add an input to the page. So now we have an input. Because there's an input, this block of styles applies. So let's add some styles to our input just so we can see it. We're going to play around with it a little bit. Ah, oh, it's a little too big. All right, so we have an input now that we can type into. So let's turn this scoped style into an element query. To do that, we need to add a responsive condition. So I'm going to say, if there's an input on the page that has at least three characters, apply this block of styles. So now we've taken what was a scoped style, we've added a responsive condition, and so now together the scoped style for this element has become an element query because we are querying this element about the validity of this condition. And so as you can see right now, our input does not have at least three characters, and it appears that the HTML element is not Lime. So what happens when we begin to add characters in here. As soon as this element query evaluates to true, this entire block applies. So let's have some fun here. And I'll show you about meta selectors. So the first thing that you'll run into 
is let's say you wanted to make this input green when there's at least three characters in it. The first thing that you would go to do would be to say, if there's an input on the page that has at least three characters, apply this block of styles. But what happens is, because we are writing the CSS for all inputs, when one matches the condition, all inputs become lime. So what some things like CSS modules try to do is create something unique and then also apply something unique to each of the elements and selectors. So now you can say, you know, when this unique element does this, only apply it to this one element. But this is not something that you need to do. This is a whole activity that would not need to be done with proper style scoping. So instead, we have a new selector called this. And so now we can refer to only those elements which evaluate to true. So if we say, I'm going to copy this out of here for a second. If there's an input on the page, for each input that there is, this input is line. So now, when we add our responsive condition, we can expect that only the input that matches the condition of minimum three characters will itself get a background of lime. So that does exactly what we think it should do. So let's have some fun with some other meta selectors. Another one that people have been wanting for a long time in CSS is parent. And uh, we have direct descendant selectors. So you could say like body directly containing a section element, but there's no way for you to say, you know, like a body that is the child of an HTML element. And so for a lot of reasons in the past, we've said, no, there's no way that we can do this in a performant way because CSS goes top to bottom. It goes down the tree, not up. In this case here, where we've got a scoped element, we kind of have like a point of reference in the middle of the DOM. And so it's really not that hard for us to just look at the parent node. So here, how about this? Here is an element query that says, if the input has at least three characters, make the parent element of that input lime. So here it's going to be the body because we haven't specified anything. So that's something people have been wanting to do in CSS for a long time. So here's another one, the previous element to the element in the scope. So if an input has at least three characters, make the previous element green. That's another one where CSS can select a sibling. So you could say like li plus anything, and it's going to select the next element. But there's no way for you to say select the element before this one. And it's rare that you'd need it but it's very handy to have it. So let's have some fun uh, making some more element queries and then discuss the difference between element queries and container queries a little bit. There seems to be some confusion uh, whether this concept that I'm talking about here should be called element queries or whether it should be called container queries. And so the way that I look at it is an element query is a query on an element. Elements are something that HTML has. They're something that the DOM has. Uh, there's no concept or nothing is defined in the HTML spec as a container. And the idea of a container is kind of like an abstract concept, but you're not really querying containers. You're just querying elements. Like we've seen here at the input, they can't even contain something. It couldn't, it could not even. And so if you were strictly speaking about container queries with the idea that, uh, you know, a container query uh, can only affect itself and its children. A container query is a element query that wraps rules for other styles. Well, in that case, this syntax that I've been showing you, because it can wrap, uh, you know, styles for other elements. This is a container style syntax, but it's, it's quite obvious that you're querying an element, not a container. This doesn't even necessarily contain this. And so I feel like it's a misnomer to try to say, uh, the concept of element queries should be called container queries as a whole. Um, there definitely is 
overlap between the two ideas, but uh, container queries are a very specific and very limited subset of uh, element queries as a whole. Um, this isn't the only element query syntax that has been implemented or played around with, but in my experience, it has been the most flexible and powerful one. And so I've uh, had quite a bit of fun playing with it. So let's do something a little bit more exciting here. Um, one thing that I really want to do is experiment with the idea of uh, sharing the scope here uh, between CSS and JavaScript, kind of breaking down the wall and letting JavaScript and CSS uh, interact in a more intimate way. And so if I said on blur alert value. Um, this is going to say, as soon as I blur this, it's going to alert the value. So as you notice here, um, I'm not qualifying this by saying like this value, that would also work. But when you're on the element, you don't need it. When you're actually in the context here of like an inline JavaScript, um, you don't need it. If I was going to try to write some JavaScript by itself to do that, I'm going to have to actually select this thing first, say var input and then say uh, input add event listener. <clears throat> so here's my function. And in this moment here, um, if I were to say alert value, it's not going to work. But you can see my code does, but it just can't find value because we're not in line. We're not like right in the context of this element. And so what I want to do with element queries here would be to the ability to evaluate JavaScript right from the context as though it was right in here. Um, so let's have fun with that. Let's say I have a div. And I want that divs before pseudo element content to be um, That divs offset width. Let's give it some style so we can see it. So we have an element. <clears throat> we have an element now that the before content of this div is set to its offset width, which is how many pixels wide it's showing up. And you'll notice this number changes. As we change the width of the div. So with that in mind, let's add something else in here. So we've got a div with an aside. So we can say, um, let's make a new query for that. At element div and min width. Five hundred. This aside background line. For the aside, let's give it some fun styles so we can see it. So when the div has a minimum width of 500 pixels, 
the aside goes lime. So what we're able to do, because this breakpoint is happening based on the width of the div, is we can actually copy and paste this a few times. So now, only when it's 500 does it go green. So this is the same set of elements with the same queries, but because of this, we're seeing each one's number here, and because of this aside, it's not every aside that's changing, it's only the one inside the scoped element which matches the responsive condition on our element query. So I hope that clears up some of the language around this and clears up some of the concepts and how this particular syntax is a little bit different than some of the previous ones that have been proposed or the previous ideas that have been shared. Um, I've been using this one for two years, uh, been working with it a lot, and it has just been uh, a lifesaver. I feel like at least once a month or sometimes even like once a week, I have this moment where it's like, oh my goodness, this just saved the day. Uh, so I'm very passionate and excited to share with people because I think there's a lot of power and potential here. And so I just really want to get this, uh, get the news out about this. And I guess you can tell I'm Canadian. <laughs> so have a good day.